Thank you so much. Well, I was told by someone in first service to uh, ramp it up, so these first two rows, y'all are in the splash zone now. Get ready. Um, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Not really. Um, <laughs> well, today, this month, um, uh, th- this week, in fact, we kind of move into this time of the holiday season. Uh, this is one of my favorite times of the year. Um, in fact, my, my three favorite days of the year are coming up soon. Uh, we've got Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, and Black Friday. <laughs> and I can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Um, but, but really, this is, this is an amazing time of year. We get to gather together with friends, with family, for uh, meals, for opening presents that we give each other, um, and, and all of these other traditions. Um, there, there's some traditions I'm looking forward to as well that are specific uh, to my family. Um, the, the week before Christmas, my dad and I always go out on what we call the cheese hunt. And so we go to a bunch of different grocery stores and look for um, different like, uh, kinds of nice cheeses and, and, um, and crackers and um, summer sausage to put on a charcuterie board for, uh, for Christmas Eve. It's a, it's, a different, it's a weird tradition, I know, but it's something we love to do. Um, I, I'm also excited for, you know, some of the stress that comes along with this because it's, it's a good kind of stress. Uh, there's the stress of, of uh, what gifts to get each other, uh, what food to cook, whether you'll be watching football or the National Dog Show on Thanksgiving. <laughs> we get to enjoy these celebrations uh, once a year. and We love when this time comes around. Um, I'm so excited for, for all of the things that come come up soon, and I'm excited for my dad's green bean casserole and, and all of these things. These traditions, they're, they're things that have been passed down from generation to generation, um, from parents to children, and so on and so on, and so it probably doesn't surprise you to know that these traditions aren't exactly new. Um, these have been going on for years and years, and, and this, this idea of celebration and, and holidays isn't new either. I think of the, the Mexican festival of the Day of the Dead uh, or the Indian festival of Diwali. The, there's celebrations, even as small as birthdays and, and weddings. These go back years and years and years, and people have been celebrating uh, for as long as we can remember. Celebrations are nothing new. History is full of it. And the people in our text this morning, uh, they're getting ready for and they're preparing for a celebration coming up soon. We're going to be in John 13 today, so if you have your Bibles with you, start flipping the pages to John 13. Um, It's actually, I was talking to Bob last night about uh, this past week and what you guys have been reading, and um, apparently you guys have actually been pretty pretty in this passage recently, uh, which is really good because I I hope today that we're able to um, not not try and correct anything, but to build on top of what you guys already have been learning and and listening to, and, and I'm so excited for that. So in John 13, uh, starting in verse 1, we read this. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's it's just one verse. But, But there's so much context here. Well, to start, let's revisit the idea of festivals, of celebrations, right? They're talking about the Passover festival. Well, the Passover festival, it, it marked this specific time in the year, um, early spring. It was the year's first harvest of grain. And so um, they would make uh, these large meals made of barley and, and all of these other uh, foods. And it was an all-hands-on-deck affair. Everyone was cooking. Everyone was, was making food. Everyone was getting prepared for the meal. And so it's, it's all about this meal that they have. But more than that... It's actually a celebration of love. Now, when I say a celebration of love, your mind kind of goes to Valentine's Day in February, but this isn't about Hallmark cards and Russell Stover chocolates. This is, this is something a little bit deeper than that. This is a celebration of the love of God. It's rooted in God's redemption for His people. You see, this celebration of Passover, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, um, to, to when God was leading the Israelites out of Egypt. And he tells Moses to um, go and, and do all of this and tell uh, Pharaoh to lead uh, the people out of Egypt. 
and Pharaoh says no, and so there's these, these ten plagues that get thrown onto Egypt. I mean, th- there's a lot of history here, so if I'm going too fast, please take some time later and, and read through this, because this is a, a pretty huge moment for the Israelites. And so we get to the, the tenth plague, uh, which is uh, the death of the firstborn son. And so to, to show God that they were with him and, and that um, the Israelites were the people of God, what they did was they sacrificed a lamb and they put the blood of the lamb on the door. And that would symbolize that, uh, that they were with God, that they were, uh, they were God-fearing people. And so for the Passover celebration, to, to celebrate this time, it was a, passable, or it was a festival of, uh, of sacrifice, of love and of sacrifice. And what they would do is, is they, would, uh, they would sacrifice a lamb or an animal similar to, to what they did in the Old Testament. This was to show God uh, the love that they had for him and the love that he has for them. Their minds were on the love of God, this whole festival, this whole Passover. And something that John teaches us in, in this chapter, John 13, is that we love as Jesus loves we're going to get to see how Jesus kind of flips the script on us here and, and shows us a different way of thinking. And so I want, I want you guys to ask yourself a question as we read through this, and that is, how do we love as Jesus loves? So we're going to continue on uh, in verse 2. And John kind of writes in, in some spiritual and confusing ways sometimes, and I, I understand that, but here he actually kind of slows down for a second. And he sets this up like a, like a movie scene or a, uh, you know, in a book somewhere. And he sets it up scene by scene, uh, dialogue by dialogue. And so we get to see exactly what's happening here. So, so pay attention as we move forward. In verse 2, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all these things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from, his, from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. So Jesus is sitting at dinner with his friends. They're getting ready to celebrate this, Pas- or this Passover festival, this giant festival feast that they've been preparing for days and days, this huge event. Everyone is ready to celebrate. They don't think anything of this night. It's another Passover festival. It's just another day in the year that we celebrate. But we get a glimpse into what Jesus already knows. He knows that Judas has been tempted to betray him. And Jesus knows that he's going to do it. But rather than get up and make a, a big scene about this or, or try and take out Judas some way and get him out in the, you know, outside and, hey, let's go out in, in the yard and you know, fight it out or something that we would try and do. No, Jesus, Jesus subverts our, our expectations. He goes in a different direction. John said he knew all these things. He knew the power that he had, what the evening would hold, what, what he was being asked to do by his father. But rather than act in any way that we would, he poured water into a basin and washed his disciples' feet. I won't get into specifics to to gross you out or anything, but these disciples' feet were dirty. Like, really, really dirty. They're wearing sandals, and if they're not wearing sandals, they're probably not wearing anything at all. And they're walking around these streets day after day with almost nothing on. And so their feet are dirty, and nobody, nobody wanted to do this. But Jesus gets down at a time that he knows will be one of his last with his friends, and he serves them. He serves them. Let's keep reading in in verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. 
No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord Simon Peter said, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And if you are clean, or and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that's why he said, not everyone was clean. So we got the whole service thing. Like this is an amazing moment, but then, then Jesus says this at the end that kind of puts us in a different mindset. It, it kind of confuses us a little bit. What does he mean not every one of them is clean? Well, let's continue reading. In verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am, that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So here we have one of the most famous examples of servitude ever written, ever seen. Please understand the drama of this moment for a second. For starters, Jesus is regarded as their superior. He talks to them and he says, you call me teacher and Lord, for that is what I am. He was above them. He was their teacher. He was their Lord. And yet, he gets down and washes their feet. See, this is completely countercultural to everything that they know. It would be like if the Roman emperor did the same for one of his servants. This is completely unheard of. And yet, Jesus controls the narrative. The one superior to all of them, he he flips the coin and shows them that he is unlike any other king. He's a king that's willing to lead by example. We see in, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus is explicitly telling them that they are to live by the example that he just taught. Blessed are those who do this, is the end of verse 17. What what would it look like for us to do that? I I know you guys have been learning and and listening to uh, us talking about John 13 for the past week or so. What would it look like for us to embody this? For us to embody this, this heart of service? Would it look like going out in in our community and and helping those in need? Would it look like helping out on a a weekend when you really don't want to, but you have to make some 90 gallons of stew or whatever it was? (laughs) Maybe it looks like finding ways to help right in your hometown, right in your own church. Maybe it looks like being willing to volunteer for children's or youth ministry. Maybe it looks like uh, being a greeter or, or even looking at the missions board and, and seeing some of the missions that your church supports, saying, hey, I want to go there or I want to help them out in some way. Let me figure out how. There are so many opportunities that God puts in front of us all the time to humble ourselves and serve. And after this amazing display of of service and and love, you may expect this round of applause. All of the disciples get up from their chairs. They they start clapping and, and calling Jesus Lord and teacher, for that is who he is, right? Except that's not what happens. Yet again, Jesus, he subverts our expectations. He says this, starting in verse 18. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture. 
He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. We, we read that and we go, how, how could Jesus be troubled in spirit? I mean, he knows what's going to happen, right? Just imagine for a second, you're at dinner with 12 of your closest friends. You've been doing life with them for, for who knows how long at this point. It's been years. They know you so closely. They know more than just your favorite color. They, they know your, your deepest things that you hold. And you know the same about them. And you know that one of them is going to betray you that night. Would that not just eat you alive on the inside? See, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. And this hurt him. However, he also knew his mission. Continuing on, John says this, starting in verse 22. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John, I love that he puts that in there, uh, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. So, leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So, Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas was in charge of the money, some thought that Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. I do kind of love when John does some of the sermon writing for us here. You see, the, the disciples, they didn't know what was going on because they, they assumed that he just meant, hey, Judas, go help out someone or, or go get the things prepared for the festival tonight. But Jesus, he knew. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew that the moment that Judas took the piece of bread that Satan entered him. Just fast forward for a second with me uh, to the Easter story. If you guys have heard the Easter story before, this will be familiar, but if not, here's kind of a spoiler alert. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah, uh-oh, tonight, <laughs> that night uh, was the night that Judas betrayed Jesus. It's the night that, that Jesus is tried in front of a court and he is found guilty even though he is innocent. He is, he is murdered in the most excruciating way possible. And he knew all of this was ahead of him. And, and not in just a way where it's like you have a project a couple days away and you're just like, ah, I'm going to put that off. That's next week's me problem. No, that this was now. This was tonight. But Jesus didn't back down. You see, his mission from his father was more important than the suffering that he had ahead. So I'm on the tennis team at Johnson. And uh, when you think of tennis players, you don't think of guys that can bench 300 pounds or something like that. Like we're not, we're not that strong or we're not that fast, but we still have to train. Like we still have to uh, be ready for tennis. And so one of the things we do is we go back to school two weeks early uh, before classes start, before any of that starts up. Uh, and, and that two weeks, all that we do is train. And man, is it hard. Uh, our schedule looks something like this. Uh, we wake up at 5.30-ish uh, to go train at 6 a.m. 
and we do conditioning for about an hour. It's, it's really, really rigorous. And then we eat breakfast and lunch, and, and then we have practice for about two hours. And then after that, there is another hour of uh, training afterwards. It is tough. It, it's like that day after day for two weeks straight until by the time that classes start, you're actually thankful to be in a classroom, which is something that I can't say for all the time. There's a lot of shared groans from tired arms, sore legs, and the one practice where you just run for an hour and there's six of you laying in one room just on your backs, not able to move. But let me tell you something. I am so glad that we do it. Because when it comes to the season, when it comes to uh, the, the tough matches, the long nights, the altogether tiring schedule of tennis, we're ready. We're ready for what lies ahead. The mission is greater than the suffering that we endure for just a moment. And we are all in on it. There's something that uh, my preaching professor told, told me and a couple other people when we were reading through this passage. He said, humble love is devoted love. Humble love is devoted love. We walk through Jesus' incredible display of humility and love by, by washing his disciples' feet. That's a, that's a humble love. That's a love that we should desire to have. It's, it's a love that Jesus told us that we should have. But how do we do that? How do we do that consistently and, and have that as our goal? Well, that's where this comes in. A humble love is devoted Love. Jesus knows the mission. He knows what is ahead. But he is devoted. He doesn't back down from the mission. Let me tell you one thing about those preseason workouts. They will humble you so quickly. But we are devoted. Like I said, we are all in on it. Just think with me for a second what it would look like if we were all in on God's mission. If we were as devoted to God's mission as we are to our college football teams, as we are to our high school sports and, and athletics and whatever else you can think of. Imagine for a second if we were all in on the mission of God. Imagine the impact that we could have, that this church could have in the community if we were devoted, if we are devoted. Humble love is devoted love. Starting in verse 31. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will only be with you a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you're, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A new commandment is given. This is the pinnacle of everything. This is the giant climax to the story. This is the biggest moment in this entire chapter. To comprehend the complexity of, of all of this, we've got to understand the context in which we are reading. You see, in, in the Old Testament... Uh, God shows his love through commandments. I know that sounds weird. We don't think of, of rules and, and laws as being uh, loving, um, but that's what it was. These commandments that, that the Jewish God, our God Yahweh, gave to the Israelites centuries ago, uh, this is what shaped who they were and what they were known by. The first and foremost of these commandments you shall have no other gods before me. 
Now, there's, there's no explicit mention of love here. It's not, you shall not love other gods before me. It's, you shall not have other gods before me. So Jesus, claiming to be the divine king, gives them a new commandment. It says, love one another. Is this an addition? Does this, does this overshadow the other one? Is this a contradiction? No. See, what's actually happening here is that these two work in tandem. Like I said, the first commandment, it doesn't explicitly mention love. But to the people that it was given to, it was implicitly understood that this is the love that binds them together. This is what binds the Israelite people and God together, Yahweh and the Jewish people. It began with love. And now it's coming full circle with love again. It is by love that Jesus came to teach and redeem. It is by love that He gave the example of servitude. It is by love that Yahweh has stuck with an undeserving people day after day, year after year, generation after generation, even until now. It is by love, it is by love, it is by love. Isn't that like a beautiful way to think of all of this? I can just imagine like sitting in a theater. I'm a movie guy, if you couldn't tell. You're sitting in a theater and you're watching the scene fade to black as those words echo. It is by love. It is by love. It is by love. It's the overarching story of the Bible. God's love for us. You see, the credits don't roll yet, though. The story isn't over. We have a little bit of an epilogue here that John shows us. So the screen opens back up. And we see this moment, and Peter and Jesus are face to face, having a conversation in that same room. And John opens it back up in verse 36. We read this. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. That verse is the end of this chapter. This chapter which shows us the amazing love that Jesus has for us. How to serve and how to walk humbly and devoted to the mission of God. It ends in this moment where Jesus tells Peter he is going to disown him three times. But you see, in that last verse, that question that Jesus asks, that's, that's what John wants to leave us with here. Will you really lay down your life for me? You see, Peter, Simon Peter, goes on to disown Jesus three times before the rooster crows. Just like he says. He messes up. But isn't that our story too? See, time after time, we cry out to God only to mess up time and time again. But look for a second at what happens to Peter. Again, if we fast forward and look at Peter's life, he does amazing things for the kingdom of God. He becomes one of the early church leaders that builds the foundation on which we stand. But that night, I can, I can just imagine those words echoing in Peter's mind. Will you really lay down your life for me? He's thinking to himself, what, what did he mean by that? I said I would. I, I don't understand. And then he sees Jesus beaten, crucified. The full weight of that question rests on his shoulders. 
we began this, this passage by asking the question, how do we love as Jesus loves? Well, how does he love? 1 John 3.16 says this, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus asked Peter this question. Will you really lay down your life for me? Because that is how he loves. He laid down his life for us, and so should we lay down our lives to Jesus. To walk humbly with him. To devote ourselves to his mission. We love as Jesus loves. So these next days, these next weeks, I pray that we have these words echoing in our minds. Will you really lay down your life for me? Will you walk humbly, be devoted to the mission? Will you pray with me?